What if Neo took the blue pill? What if Luke Skywalker turned to the dark side? What if Colby Covington is really just a nice guy? These questions have plagued mankind and MMA fans for, well, the last couple of years at least, along with the idea that some of the greatest fighters of all time had their careers cut short before they could truly reach their full potential. So I'm asking you today, MMA fans, what if? What if these fighters overcame the hurdles at which they stumbled, didn't pick up that injury, or actually took the next step in competition? What's up guys, it's me, Bailey, and guess what? What? Jocko is back with their brand new product, Jocko Milk. The all new Jocko Milk, ready to drink protein shakes, designed and engineered with a protein blend of milk protein, concentrate, and calcium cassinate. Oh, It's a protein blend that helps fuel muscle growth and recovery all day long. 180 calories with no added sugar, no artificial sweeteners or colors, and still tastes unbelievable. Unbelievable! It doesn't have that protein chalk taste to it. Both the chocolate and vanilla flavors they just hit different. Make sure you use your 10% off exclusive code, MMA on point. More on that later, but for now, here are the 10 biggest what if careers in MMA. Number 10, Shane Carwin. In any movie with a submarine or a spaceship, there's always some massively jacked dude working in the engine room, turning some kind of lever in a crisis situation, trying to prevent everything from exploding. Well, that guy is literally Shane Carwin, a heavyweight monster who moonlights as an engineer with hands the size of rum ham. Maybe I'm just not the norm for an engineer. I don't know. Apart from beginning his athletic career as a gold medal winning Div 2 wrestler, he had the combined minds of Trevor Whitman and Greg Jackson behind him, molding his raw talents. Every single fight he won, he finished in the first round, some of them as quickly as 20 seconds, and after eight wins, he joined the UFC where he ran through the heavyweight division flatlining three more opponents before KOing Frank Mir for the interim title. Holy guacamole, Shane Carwin was 12-0 all by first round finish. He could touch you and you'd be paralyzed like he was some giant human jellyfish. He unloaded one of the most savage beatings of all time against Brock Lesnar when he fought for the actual title which frankly could have been stopped multiple times but instead of making Brock stand back up he gassed himself out and was submitted. After that, it was revealed he'd been suffering from multiple injuries to his neck and his back. His hands and arms would go numb, and he was out for 12 weeks just for rehab after undergoing surgery. The doctors said they were surprised he'd even been able to compete. The bones had grown in around the nerves bad enough where the, the surgeon felt that we needed to do uh, surgery and get it corrected, uh, you know, as soon as possible. When he did return against Junior Dos Santos, he looked like a shadow of himself and was picked apart and retired shortly after, citing multiple injuries. Which, of course, was a massive shame. What if he didn't suffer those injuries? He was arguably the hardest hitting heavyweight of all time with a collegiate wrestling background. Who knows how far he could have taken his career? There were still plenty of fights left for him on the table and he matched up well with a lot of guys. Number nine, Donald Cerrone. Most of you know who Cowboy Cerrone is, a former WEC contender that arrived in the UFC with a bang throwing more Wild West head kicks than the Shanghai Kid. And across his 12-year UFC career, I can count at least four separate win streaks that led him to big fights and big opportunities, but unfortunately each time he just wasn't able to get it done. After just four wins on his arrival into the UFC, they matched him against Nate Diaz in the co-main event at UFC 141. But Nate spent the whole pre-fight and actual fight taunting him, and Donald later admitted he fought angry, and it completely took him out of his game plan. Don't fight out of anger. Right, right. They say that for a reason. I mean, yeah. that's, so when I fought out of anger, I mean, that's, I was just, I don't know what the fuck I was doing. I was just... I sucked that night. It was a learning lesson, sure, but what if he'd actually been able to compose himself and beat Nate that night? I mean, the leg kicks were certainly effective, just not until the third round. A few wins later, and he got Anthony Pettis in a title eliminator, but since admittedly Cowboy is a slow starter, he didn't have a chance really to get going in this one and was finished with a body kick in just two and a half minutes. He would then build up another eight-fight win streak in just a two-year period and was booked in a rematch with RDA, this time for the actual title. But even the narrative in the build-up was, although Donald could clean out the division, he choked when it came to big fights, and once again, he was finished quickly before the fight had even started. It just seemed to be a hurdle that Cowboy could never get over. What if he figured out a way to win in these high-pressure fights, to better control the emotions he always talks about having backstage? It's possible that Donald Cerrone could have been a UFC champion. Number eight, Pyotr Jan. I just want to remind those fans that aren't aware that the Russian master of sport in boxing was 15-1 and before he fought Aljamain Sterling the first time. His only loss was a split decision way back in his sixth ever fight and he'd absolutely terrorized the bantamweight division of the UFC as the boogeyman for the last three years. He finally had the title after beating Jose Aldo and he was kind of dominating the fight against Sterling. But I want to ask you guys, what if? What if he never threw that bloody knee? The knee that got him disqualified. The knee that lost him his title and has now turned his whole career sideways. Chances are, more than likely, Aljo wouldn't have gotten an immediate rematch. 
he was winning the fight. So it would have been on to the next contender, Corey Sandhagen, who Jan was able to beat. Would O'Malley still have gotten a shot at him next? Who knows? But it's possible in some weird reality that Piotr Jan could still be the UFC bantamweight champion and not on a free fight losing streak. Either that or Marab might have actually gotten a chance at the belt. Definitely not after that Jose Aldo performance, though. Marab didn't go after it like, you know, a guy that looks like he wants to fight for the title. Number seven, Dominic Reyes. Undefeated as an amateur, undefeated on his way to a UFC title shot, Dom Reyes had a flawless run for his MMA career all the way to, well, John Jones. And a lot of people said it was pretty early for him to be there. The only way you can possibly win this fight it's, it's to catch me with, with, with the left. I could submit you, I could out-wrestle you, I can kickbox you to death. Bro, I'm gonna get you. But to be fair, he had four first round finishes in the UFC, which is the kind of thing that's gonna get you a title shot. And based on how the fight went down, it's pretty hard to argue he wasn't ready. His takedown defense was great. He outlanded John throughout the five rounds. And honestly, just speaking personally here, at the end of the fight, when the ref was about to raise someone's hand, I thought to myself, this is it. This is the moment John Jones actually loses. But he didn't. The fight was super close, but you know what I'm gonna ask you, don't you? What if he actually beat John Jones? He would have been the champion. Let's face it, he probably would have had to fight John again in the rematch, but considering his confidence seemed to help him the most the first time around, who knows if he wouldn't have been able to produce the same or even better results. Or maybe John would have trained all that much harder, who knows. Or maybe he'd have gone to heavyweight. Either way, the Yan loss came as both his parents contracted COVID, so he couldn't see them for three months, which he said really affected him. So I'm in camp, I can't see my mom or my dad. Suddenly, not confident and who I am anymore. And get this, he also switched coaches after losing to John Jones in an effort to try and change his style. I left to go train with my brother um, in Victorville at a different gym. Not uh, what you want to do when you have a title fight going on, mm -hmm. changing up your camp. Which definitely did not work out for him. So what if he won? Maybe he never would have switched coaches. Maybe he could have carried on his undefeated dominating streak. I guess we'll never know. Number six, David Terrell. At one point in time, a lot of the MMA community considered David Terrell the next big thing to hit the UFC. He got a few wins at IFC and Pancrase, and as a black belt under Caesar Gracie, he was his best prospect at the time. He'd been dominating at grappling tournaments, including the ADCC trials and the Gracie Superfight Openweight competition. He was brought into the UFC on a trade for free Pancrase fighters. That's how bad they wanted him. And he was thrown in to take care of the number one contender, Matt Lindland, and he did in just under 30 seconds in his very first UFC fight. But after just one victory, he was sent to fight Evan Tanner for the vacant middleweight title. And it was just far too soon for David, and he was stopped in the first round. As well as that, a lifetime of competition had started to catch up with him, and he had injuries that started to compile. He also talked about how he simply was not ready for that level of fame, money, and opportunity in just his seventh pro fight. Evan was already a 12-fight UFC veteran with a record of 30 and 4, and was on his own journey and the path of true redemption. Joe Rogan called it at the end of the fight. <laughs> So what if David had been able to manage his injuries? What if he'd had a few more fights before being thrown into a title shot as the favorite? What if it had been any other man than the indomitable Evan Tanner? And what if David had just been able to keep it together mentally? Number five, Chael Sonnen. Well, I think you know where I'm going with this one before we even get started. If you know anything about the career of the bad guy, you'll know he had massive fights that generated a ton of hype with the fan base, but ultimately, he could never seem to win the title. Kind of all goes back to his amateur wrestling days, where he twice won silver at the Pac-10 Championships and at the Greco-Roman World University Championships. His first run towards the UFC title was stopped in a number one contender fight against Damian Meyer, where he found himself stuck in a triangle, and then after three more wins, he fought Anderson Silva, and well, I'm pretty sure you all know what happened. He dominated the entire five round fight until the last two minutes where Anderson was able to lock up another triangle choke and force Chael to tap. But what if he didn't? What if, like he said, he only lost the round and not the whole fight? And the way I thought it worked was that if you tapped, you lost that round. So I thought what they would do is they go to a judge's decision, they go four rounds to one, and we go home and I'd be the new champion. He, not Chris Weidman, would have been the man to beat Addison Silva. Imagine the legacy Chael Sonnen would have now if he had been the guy to dethrone the GOAT. 
Imagine the trash talk. I mean, come on. I mean, he didn't actually lose to anyone else at middleweight in the UFC apart from Anderson Silva after that. And it wasn't just the fact he tapped. It was the mental battle that he had been struggling with as well. I've won every round I've ever fought. I've never been in a tough fight. I've never had stitches. I've never broken it. I've dominated everybody and I've lost eight fights. There's something going on here and it's not physical. There's something going on that I can dominate eight minutes of a fight, seven minutes of a fight, nine minutes of a fight, and find a way out. What if Chael had been able to battle through those demons the night of UFC 117? We might be looking at his career in an entirely different way. Number four, Yuki Nakai. If you've been watching any of our content recently, you'll know that this man, Yuki Nakai, has come up a few times, mainly because of what Gerard Gordeau did to him at the Valet Tudo tournament in 1995. But let's talk about his actual career for a second, because most of you probably don't know he was a legit MMA prospect and possibly one of the best grapplers in the world. He started out his career in Shuto, where after eight fights, he had lost only once and secured the welterweight championship, putting his record at 7-1-1 one, and one when he went into the Valet Tudo tournament. It's a pretty goddamn good record. Then he got blinded and I gouged by Gerard Gordeau, but he still submitted him, even though he was a whole foot taller and weighed about 60 more pounds. And despite that, he continued to the next round, where he also tapped Craig Pittman. Pittman had been a two-time championship wrestler in the US Marines and outweighed Nakai by 100 pounds, but somehow Yuki still managed to beat him, and he was still blind. By this point, though, he was completely battered, but it still took the legendary Hicks and Gracie six minutes before he finally succumbed and tapped to him. Six minutes passed. Now six minutes passed. And you kind of have to ask, what if Gerard never eye gouged him? What if he got opponents that didn't massively outweigh him in that tournament, even though everyone outweighed him in that tournament? But Hickson had a much easier time and fought guys that were just one and two in their MMA careers and had Yuki not gotten so beaten up, perhaps their fight would have gone differently. He also had to retire after losing his eyesight and had he kept fighting now at nine and two, who knows how far he could have gone. The next Shuto welterweight champion after him, Carl Uno, went to the UFC to fight Jens Pulver for the inaugural lightweight title. He very well may have had that chance. He could have been a UFC champion, but of course, he had been blinded in one eye and had to retire. Actually, that still leads us on to number three, Hickson Gracie. Unanimously throughout the 90s, if anyone asked who the best Gracie was, absolutely all of them would have told you it was Hickson. The only reason he of course didn't fight in UFC 1 was because Hoist was a smaller man and the whole thing really was just a marketing promotion for BJJ. Hickson himself was made the subject of the now legendary documentary Choke, which detailed his life, training regime and preparations for the 1995 Valet Tudo event, where he faced Yuki in the final round. At that time, he was being called the no-holds-barred king following his clean sweep of the tournament the previous year. It's like you have the era of Hickson. Yeah. A lot of unbelievable fighters, but you're in the wrong decade to have Hickson there, you know? <laughs> Hickson had his first MMA fight as early as 1980 in an independent promotion in Brazil. It wasn't until 1994 where he competed in Valet Tudo that people saw for the first time how dominant he was, but after that, he only competed five more times before retiring from the sport entirely. After Valet Tudo, he had two fights in Pride against Nobuhiku Takada. In fact, the name of the promotion Pride takes its name from the rivalry between those two. And after beating him twice, he fought once more against Fumaki in Japan. But Takada had never really been one of the best in the world, and Fanaki was well past his prime by that point. But what if he didn't retire at 12-0? What if he kept competing, made it to the UFC, or even stayed in pride to take on some of the other actual legends like Mark Coleman, Dan Seven, or Sakuraba? We may have gotten a chance to see if he was actually as good as everyone said he was. According to him, though, he didn't like the new UFC rules, and sadly, when his son passed in 2000, a supposed bout with Sakuraba was cancelled, and he retired from the sport. Could he have been one of the greatest of all time? But he never took a step up in competition and retired early, so I guess we will never know. Number two, Frank Shamrock. Without a doubt in his era, the younger Shamrock brother was the best fighter in the world. He was the first guy to really be able to threaten and beat any fighter on the feet with his wrestling or with his submission game. His upbringing was about as tough as it could be, bouncing from foster homes to crisis centers and run-ins with the law before being adopted by Bob Shamrock. He even spent three years in Folsom Prism after being convicted of burglary. Eventually, he began training in shoot wrestling and developed a well-rounded MMA game, which took him to the King of Pancrase title in 96 and the inaugural UFC light heavyweight title, which he won in just 16 seconds. 
He then defended the belt on four separate occasions, the last being against an upcoming Tito Ortiz in a Fight of the Year winner. It was at that moment Bob Merowitz famously gave him the belt and announced him to be the greatest champion to ever grace the octagon. And then Frank retired in the prime of his career with the UFC on his shoulders and full title defenses under his belt. And you know what? He didn't even stay retired that long. He was back the next year, but he would never compete in the UFC again. So the question is, what if he didn't leave the UFC? How long could he have defended the belt? Would we have seen him fight guys like Vanderlei Silva? What if he went to Pride and got some of the fights he wanted, like the matchup against Sakuraba? What he did instead was go to Strike Force, where he took some pretty bad fights, like the Caesar Gracie one, and then big names he did fight at the end of his career like Nick Diaz and Kung Lee, but those came nine years after he left the UFC and he was way past his prime. Frank had already achieved great things within the sport, but what if he stayed? He could have maybe been one of the greatest of all time. Number one, Cain Velasquez. Okay, let me put into perspective the early UFC career of Cain Velasquez for those of you who just weren't around to see it. Because I already know those of you who were are just already dying to tell me how Cardio Cain was the best heavyweight of all time. He made his UFC debut at just 2-0 and the fights against his first three UFC opponents just weren't even fair. He savagely tore through them. He had relentless combinations, takedowns, ground and pound. They looked like they were at day one of MMA class. If you haven't seen them, go watch them to truly understand how goddamn good he was. Then after Czech Congo took him to a decision in a fight Kane landed 246 strikes to Congo's 42, he finished another three straight opponents in vicious fashion, including a complete battering of the champion Brock Lesnar in the first round. Seven UFC wins without barely breaking a sweat, people. We were already calling Kane the greatest heavyweight of all time, but this is where his injuries started to catch up with him. Going into his first title defense against Junior Dos Santos, he was dealing with a torn ACL that was caught on camera and he was finished in just one minute. Now, what if he had more time to rehab the injury and go in 100%? What would have happened? Well, we saw it in the rematch. He absolutely beat the brakes off JDS and left him unrecognizable. Twice, he probably would have held on to his belt and been able to rack up some title defenses. And then once he did have the belt firmly back in his hand, he was booked against Fabricio Verdum in Mexico at 7,300 feet, an elevation which admittedly he didn't adequately prepare for. But what if he did? What if he went out like Verdum did a month early and probably acclimatized to the altitude? He could have broken the UFC record for title defenses on that very night. Sadly, after that, Kane dealt with injury after injury that quickly took him out of his prime, but there will always be that question. What if he was able to keep it all together? Could he have cemented himself as literally one of the greatest of all time? Before we go, one more big shout out to the boys at Jocko Fuel, the OG MMA On Point partners. They're back with a brand new product, Jocko Milk. 180 calories with no added sugar, no artificial sweeteners or colors. This ready to drink protein shake designed and engineered with a protein blend of milk, protein concentrate and calcium cassidate is the protein blend that helps your muscle growth and recovery all day long. Make sure you use your 10% off exclusive code MMA on point. Hard work, clean fuel, no excuses. I've got another what if question though. What if George Hutchinson never joined the MMA on point team, eh? He wouldn't have been able to edit this video for you. Go on, give him a follow at G Hutchinson MMA. Also, what if Ben Rosette never picked up a guitar? We would never have gotten that MMA on point intro theme, which we do so enjoy. So if you want to listen to more of him, check him out on Spotify. Now then, out of all these great careers that were somewhat cut short, who left the most on the table? What's your biggest MMA what if? Let us know in the comments down below. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video and hit the subscribe button if you want to see more. I've been Bailey and I'll see you in the next one. Thank <laughs> you.